Assalamualaikum and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. As we're about to begin, please stand by. I would like to seek for your kind cooperation to avoid any virtual disturbance during this, this live broadcast sessions. If you have any questions, the conference resource personnel are ready to attend you at the reception desk. Thank you for your kind cooperation and attention. We will begin shortly. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wabarakatuh and a very good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the first Malaysia International Conference on Nanotechnology and Catalysis Research, Catalysis, MICNC 2021. I hope all our participants still bear with us and enjoy the conference day. We are now in the keynote session five. Today, I will we will have three keynote speakers that will share their presentation with us. I'm Marlinda Abdurrahman from Nanotechnology and Catalysis Research Center, University of Malaya, and I will share I will chair this morning session together with the session moderator. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like again to seek your kind cooperation to avoid any virtual disturbance during the session. For those who are intent to ask the question. To our honorable speaker, you can channel your question in the chat box. Your question will be raised in the question banner, as I will read as I will read uh, accordingly. Before we start, I'm honored to give in brief introduction about our keynote speaker. I'm pleased to give a brief introduction of Prof. Professor Dr. Karen Wilson from the Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology, RMIT, Australia. The Professor Dr. Wilson is a professor of catalysis at the Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology, RMIT. Having recently left of her role as a research director and professor, of catalysis at the European Bio Bioenergy Research Institute, EBRI at Aston University. In her previous position at the Cardiff University of, in 2011, she was awarded an industry fellowship to work with Johnson Matthew on the developments of catalysis for fuel cell. Attention to all, we will play a pre-recorded video presentation from Professor Karen with her title presentation of Sustainable Catalytic Biorefining Challenge and Opportunity for Catalyst Design. Since she cannot be with us today during the live session. If you have any questions regarding the presentation, you may put your questions in the chat box. We will try our best to channel your questions to the professor via her email. Without further ado, let's give a full attention to her presentation video. Hey, I'm Professor Karen Wilson from RMIT University in Melbourne, Australia. Uh, it's a pleasure to give this invited lecture today. And I'd also like to thank uh, the organisers for giving me the opportunity to present our work. So what I want to talk to you about today is what we've been doing on development of catalysts to improve the sustainability of chemical processes. Um, and one of the driving forces for this is global warming and considering the impact that fossil fuel um, utilisation has had on CO2 emissions and um, obviously a vast majority of chemicals and fuels currently still rely on the use of fossil fuels and heterogeneous catalysts have underpinned uh, the petrochemical refinery where you take the fossil fuels have been taken they've been cracked through to fuels or they've been refined uh, through to chemicals and in this instance uh, fuels are viewed as high volume uh, relatively low value um, products um, and the overall economics of a petrochemical refinery 
are driven by the production of higher value, lower volume products that go into the production of chemicals and consumer products. Now, going forward, what we need to think about is how we can find alternative feedstocks that can displace uh, fossil fuels. Now, while there's, in terms of energy, people might look at uh, fuel cells, battery technology, etc. Um, there are very few renewable technologies um, that can replace the production of chemicals. Um, and the one that is most widely uh, viewed as being a potential uh, replacement for, for petrochemical feedstocks is biomass. Um, so in a biorefinery, what we would be looking to do is to take waste um, biomass, so it could be from agricultural waste, corn, husks, straw, etc., um, and convert those into fuels and chemicals. Uh, and in the same way as the petrochemical refinery, the production of the chemicals would be what gives the overall process economic va value. Um, and if we're going to perform these transformations, what we also need to look at is what type of catalysts we would use to transform them and make sure that we adhere to green chemical principles during those transformations so that we don't produce more waste than is necessary. Another area that is, is growing in interest is whether you can use carbon dioxide itself as a carbon feedstock. Um, and here there's a lot of interest in the idea of uh, producing solar fuels and chemicals where CO would be reacted either over a photocatalyst or an electrocatalyst to produce hydrocarbons. And here the idea is to mimic uh, what plants do, do very well themselves of taking carbon dioxide and water and producing carbohydrates in, in the case of, um, of plants. So obviously in terms of designing catalysts for these, we need to think about the environment that the uh, reactions would proceed. So traditionally fossil fuel transformations have been performed at high temperature. Uh, they're largely hydrocarbon based. Uh, if you're looking at uh, biomass, then what you'd be looking at is mainly aqueous phase catalysis that will proceed perhaps at lower temperature. And the reason why a lot of the chemistry will be done in, the, in water is because of the high polarity of the feedstocks that we'd be looking at. So um, if you're looking at lignocellulose cellulose and transforming that, there's two general platforms. Um, there's a thermochemical platform, which is a high temperature uh, process of either pyrolysis or gasification. Uh, and in this instance, pyrolysis would take biomass, heat it at say 400, 500 degrees in an inert atmosphere, would produce an oil, and that oil could then be reformed through to fuels and chemicals. Gasification is a higher temperature process, much more destructive, destructive takes biomass through to carbon uh, monoxide, hydrogen, so syngas, and then once you've got that, you could then perform Fischer-Tropsch uh, processes on it to produce fuels and chemicals. Again, the, because these are very high temperature processes, they're very destructive, and you lose a lot of the inert, the functionality that is native to, to the biomass itself. If you look at the biochemical platform, then these are much lower temperature processes uh, and generally are based around the, the fermentation of sugars through to primarily ethanol, but of course you can also um, produce other chemicals um, using, using enzymes. But the challenge here is that you need to obtain sugars from lignocellulose. And given lignocellulose is a, a complex biopolymer comprising lignin, cellulose and hemicellulose, you first of all have to fractionate this to get the cellulose component and then uh, cleave the cellulose into, into the sugars. And then you can, you can start to uh, look at fermentation. So a lot of work going on in this area is how you can actually improve that fractionation using different solvents. So for example, ionic liquids or, or even uh, mixtures of organic solvents can be used to fractionate the, the lignin and the, the cellulose components. The challenge with, often with biochemical processes, however, is that the products you get are quite dilute and you have to then purify these and that can be quite energy intensive. So what we're interested in is whether we can develop heterogeneous catalysts that can be complementary to some of the enzymatic processes and convert sugars through to platform chemicals. 
We're also interested in looking at ways that we can develop better catalysts that can actually address the upgrading of pyrolysis soils to make um, fuels as well from these. So what I'll take you through is some of the uh, considerations that you need in order to, to do that. So one platform chemical that is of great interest um, to the chemical industry is, is 5-HMF. Uh, and the reason that this is of great interest is because this can be used for the production of many fuel additives uh, and also for monomers um, and bulk chemicals. So here you can produce, for example, furan dicarboxylic acid, and this is viewed as a replacement for PET, uh, for terephthalic acid in, in uh, polymer production. So it's a very valuable platform chemical for producing a range um, of products, and this can be obtained uh, from sugars. So if we're going to take sugars and produce platform chemicals like HMF, um, what we've got to do is selectively remove oxygen um, from the, the, uh, the sugar backbone. Now, I've shown here a typical example, so this is looking at a, a different platform chemical, adipic acid. So traditionally, adipic acid is made from the oxidation of cyclohexane um, from fossil fuel-derived feedstocks. So catalysts have been developed for this process. If you want to produce adipic acid from glucose, however, you're going to have to selectively remove oxygen. So you're going to need a different type of catalyst to do this reaction. So as I was saying uh, earlier on, what we need to make sure is that if we're going to design catalysts, we should be looking at solid catalysts so they're easily to remove from the reaction. We don't want to be using soluble catalysts that will produce waste. So we need porous uh, catalysts. Because often the molecules you're working with are quite, quite bulky, um, you need to look at larger pore materials. So we spend a lot of time um, designing pore architectures that have pore dimensions uh, that are big enough to accept some of these large bulky molecules. Uh, and, and actually working on hierarchically porous solids. So in this case, having a macroporous material um, coupled up with a mesoporous material aids mass transport through porous networks. And then you've got to functionalize the, the surface in order to uh, promote the dehydration reaction or carbon oxygen cleavage. So we need to think of different active sites. So dehydration will be well suited to, for example, an acid catalyst. Hydrogenolysis might be catalyzed by, by metal sites. Um, and then you might have selective hydrogenation or oxidation. So there's often very complex cascade reactions involved in biomass transformations. Um, and because of this, we often then want to think about using bifunctional catalysts. So in this case, you want to take an alcohol through to an alkane. An acid will turn it into the alkene quite readily by dehydration, but then if you've got a metal site there, you can do the hydrogenation in the same catalyst. So bifunctional catalysis um, is very uh, promising as a way of improving the process efficiency for biomass transformations. Okay, so if I give you one example now looking at 5-HMF production, um, that can be produced from, from glucose. Uh, but it's actually a two-step reaction. Uh, so the production of 5-HMF, first of all, involves um, an isomerization reaction where glucose is transformed into fructose, uh, and that's a base catalyzed step. Then the second step is the production of 5-HMF via dehydration, and that's an acid catalyzed step. And what we want to try and do is develop a bifunctional catalyst for this. Obviously, in solution, doing uh, an acid and a base catalyzed reaction with liquid acid and liquid base couldn't be done one pot because they would just neutralize each other. However, if you're working with solid catalysts, um, you can functionalize with both acid and base sites. Um, and one of the things we noticed is that zirconia, for example, is an amphoteric um, catalytic material. So this you can actually tune the acid base properties. Um, and the way we do this is essentially zirconia itself, the O2 minus sites um, in the surface give you basicity. Uh, and if you partially sulfate the surface, you can introduce um, acid sites. And if you vary the sulfate coverage, you can vary the acid to base loading. So what we uh, discovered with this, this reaction is there's an optimum acid base loading that will give you the most uh, efficient transformation of glucose to HMF. 
Uh, and this basically corresponds to the position here where you've got enough sites to do the isomerization over the base O2- sites and enough sites to do the acid catalyzed dehydration over the sulfate sites. So when you go to very high sulfate coverages, essentially you wipe out all of the base sites and the activity drops off. So the acid base uh, ratio is, is critical for optimizing performance. Now, in this instance, the catalyst we've got is relatively so low surface area. So we've, we've moved on to looking at producing thin film zirconia catalysts in order to improve the overall process efficiency. And here what we did is we took SBA15. SBA15 is um, a high surface area silica based mesoporous material. Um, and using a solution phase atomic layer deposition approach, what we're able to do is to graft a thin film of zirconia um, from a zirconium isopropoxide precursor. So in this case, because we're using dry hexane, um, the only place that the, the propoxide will get hydrolyzed is on silanols on the surface of the SBA15. We can, so the surface itself is, it, the reaction itself is self-limiting, so once you've completely produce one monolayer, um, no further zirconia uh, grafting occurs. So you can then hydrate the sample to, to reproduce um, zirconium hydroxide and then repeat that cycle. So you can build up progressively one, two, three um, monolayers of zirconia on that SBA15 surface. And then once you've got the, the desired thickness, you can sulfate the material. Um, if you look at the TEM, what you can see is that the materials retain uh, nice, well-defined mesoporous channels. There's no evidence of any large crystallites of zirconia uh, being formed in the material, again, supporting that we have a nice layer-by-layer -layer, um, deposition. When you look at the catalysis for HMF production, um, what you can see is that the, the two monolayer um, sample, so with two cycles of grafting, um, outperforms uh, the others, and it's approximately three times more active than the best uh, material from the previous study uh, using um, a bulk uh, zirconia uh, catalyst. So by producing high surface area thin film uh, zirconia supports, we can enhance the productivity for HMF production. Okay, so the the next example I want to talk to you about um, in terms of bifunctional catalysis is how we can improve the efficiency of catalysts for hydrodeoxygenation. So hydrodeoxygenation is a key step in the production of hydrocarbons from uh, pyrolysis oil. So phenolic-like species um, are formed in, in pyrolysis oil mainly from the lignin component when biomass is pyrolyzed. Uh, and before you can actually use the, these fuels, uh, you have to remove, remove the oxygen. So typically you would use a, a hydrogenation catalyst to try and, and remove um, oxygen from the catalyst. And um, sometimes people will work uh, using hydrogenolysis and very high temperatures uh, and high metal loadings in order to try and go directly through to the hydrocarbon. What we wanted to try and do was see if we can improve the efficiency of the catalysts by working with bifunctional materials. So the first thing we, we explored with this system is um, what the impact of platinum particle size was um, using a simple platinum and SBA15 uh, catalyst. And what you can see here on the right hand side is that in terms of uh, the, inter it's quite a complex reaction, in terms of the intermediates that are formed, the main product uh, that is produced is this methoxycyclohexane uh, product here, and the hydrogenation of anisole to methoxycyclohexane uh, uh, runs much faster over smaller uh, particle sizes. The other possible products, uh, cyclohexane and benzene, which would be formed via these routes uh, here, really don't occur in, in significant amounts. So, the major reaction is, is ring hydrogenation, um, but that's where the reaction stops. We're not able to go through to the 
um, the fully deoxygenated product in any appreciable amounts. So what we st started to look at was whether or not there's any way to change the support. Um, and we discovered that if you take an acid support, so in this case, aluminium SBA15, that's very good at taking methoxycyclohexane and turning that into cyclohexene. So you can see here in the box that I've, I've shaded green, um, methox aluminium SBA15 can produce a very high yield of cyclohexene. But of course, there's no metal catalyst on that to affect the hydrogenation step. So knowing what we, we, we found out from the early part, that small metal particles are very good for uh, the production of methoxycyclohexane, we thought, well, if we actually take aluminium SB15 and dope this with small platinum nanoparticles, this should give us the most effective catalyst. And indeed, that's what we see. So in, in the, the box here, um, a platinum aluminium SB15 with very low amounts of platinum gives us the highest cyclohexane, cyclohexane yield um, of all of the catalysts we explored. So by promoting that metal acid synergy, we're able to increase the productivity for cyclohexane production by three orders of magnitude over conventional catalysts. And what's best about all of this is we're actually running this with nearly 30 times less platinum than the conventional catalyst. So it really just demonstrates how if you tune the metal acid synergy, you can optimize both precious metal use and uh, catalyst performance. Okay, so for the last part of the presentation, I really want to talk to you about um, biodiesel synthesis and how we can tune poor architectures in order to um, design better catalysts. Um, so the challenge with biodiesel synthesis is you're taking triglycerides, and tr traditionally they're base catalyzed reactions where you would react methanol with a triglyceride, that would then produce a fatty acid methyl ester and, and glycerol. Oils often contain fatty acids as well, so here you would need to also have an acid catalyst that would do an esterification to remove um, the, the fatty acids again as, fa as fatty acid methyl esters. The challenge of course is if you have a lot of free fatty acids in the oil, um, you can't really use a base catalyst for performing the transesterification because that would get rapidly poisoned by the fatty acid. So you'd have to do a pretreatment in order to remove any free fatty acids. So esterification is a key part of, of any biodiesel synthesis process. Um, but the, or the other challenge is that because the bio oils are so bulky and large, you can't really use conventional microporous materials because diffusion through the architectures will be very slow. Now, the way you can design porous architectures is to look at using templates. Um, and traditionally, things like MCM or HMS materials have used long chain alkyl amines or alkyl ammonium um, surfactants. And the micelles formed from these surfactants are what dictate the, the pore dia diameter um, of the final material. You can go to larger sizes um, and, and use these pleuronic surfactants where you have hydrophilic and hydrophobic block copolymers that when they form their micelles they'll form pores in the order of 5 to 10 nanometers. But the challenge with these is even though they're bigger than traditional surfactants, if you compare the dimensions of these pores to that of a triglyceride, you can see that they're, they're actually quite similar in size so diffusion through those channels is going to be limited. So diffusion of triglycerides is going to be slow. So what we've looked at to improve the pore structure is to introduce um, hi hierarchical pore networks in which we introduce macroporosity using a hard template. So in this instance, what we do is we take our, our pleuronic um, and our, our precursor, the TEOS uh, silica precursor. This, we, we react together to get the mesophase. We add to this a hard template based on polystyrene, so typically with pore dimensions between 100 and 500 um, nanometers. That we can then form a, 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 an array um, of, of macropores. And then when the whole thing has been aged, we have a, a monolithic-like structure where we have large voids for the macropores 
And if you look into the walls with the TEM, you can start to see the mesopause. So what we have are basically very short paths through the mesopore domains and the macropores give us rapid mass transport through the material. So this type of material should give you enhanced mass transport. So to demonstrate this, essentially we've looked at this, we've functionalized these with acid groups. Um, and what we can, we can look at here is the performance in both transesterification and esterification. And you can see just very quickly that as you incorporate more and more macroporosity going from left to right, you're able to increase the per site activity for both the esterification reaction and the transesterification reaction. So by increasing pore hierarchy, you improve mass transport and overall activity of, of the catalyst. You can also make hierarchical solid bases. Um, and here what we've done is we've taken conventional um, hydrotalcite-like materials um, and we've incorporated macropores into these structures by growing the hydrotalcites around polystyrene spheres. So we end up with these large uh, voids within the, the hydrotalcite structure. And this again enhances the diffusion of bulky triglycerides. Um, so what I've shown here is essentially the enhancement of turnover frequency as a function of hydrocarbon chain length. So very small triglycerides having uh, macropores there doesn't really impact the, the activity because these can diffuse through the st structures fairly easily. Longer chain structures end up with uh, mass transport problems and here macroporosity improves the overall performance. So we've got a system that gives us well-defined activity um, and improved diffusion um, when we put macropores in. So one thing we've been looking at is whether we can use the hierarchical porous structures to control where we put active sites. Um, and for this, we introduced the concept of spatially orthogonal catalysts, where we're able to selectively put active sites either into the mesopores or into the macropore domain. Um, and a key um, enabling factor of this was the discovery that we made that we can selectively take out the, the macropore template, the polystyrene, while leaving the, the uh, templates in the, the mesopore um, domain. So in this case, what we've been looking at is preparing an acid base functionalized spatially orthogonal catalyst. Um, and we extract uh, the polystyrene um, from the macropores, but the, the mesopores have been prepared using um, an organosurfactant, um, magnesium-doped um, uh, P123 micelle structure. So what we have here is a macropore void and a mesopore that's basically full of magnesium that's been doped into the walls. We can then, whilst those uh, templates are still in the mesopause, we can graft um, zirconia onto the surface of the, the macropore domain, um, sulfate this. So what we have is a sulfated zirconia functionalized macropore, and then the mesopores have our, our magnesium uh, active site. Once we remove the P123, um, what we essentially have now, as we can see on the left-hand side, is an acid functionalized macropore and a base functionalized mesopore. So the reason that we chose to make this material is we wanted to try and address the problem of working with high fatty acid containing um, oils and using that macropore domain as a way to esterify the fatty acids and protect the base sites in the mesopore. So if you take a um, fatty acid containing oil, as you say, you're going to have a high content of, of free fatty acids, which are blue and a lot of triglycerides, which I'm going to um, color code green. So what the, our hypothesis was is that if you take a mixture of fatty acids and triglycerides, and these basically are going into the macropore, if that macropore is acid functionalized, you should be able to transform the fatty acids rapidly into fame, um, and only the triglyceride will then go on into the mesopore 
where it would undergo transesterification. So the key thing is that we can rapidly esterify the fatty acid and stop it making it into the, the mesopore. Um, and this indeed is what we see when, when we look at the, uh, the catalyst activity. So we've done some, some tests here using sulfated zirconia um, with magnesium oxide. And, and this is our spatially orthogonal material. This is a physical mixture of sulfated zirconia and magnesium oxide. And this is just a magnesium oxide based mesoporous material. And what you can see is that if you just have pure triglyceride, all of them have the same activity. If you add fatty acid, and we're looking here at about 50% impurity added, the spatially orthogonal material performs just as it did before. There's no deactivation, whereas the other two are rapidly deactivated because the fatty acid can see the solid base catalyst and poison it rapidly. So in, in this instance, by having the spatially orthogonal material, we're able to and control the order with which uh, the, the reactants see different active sites. Okay, so I just want to wrap up and hopefully what I've shown you is that we are able to produce a range of tunable um, acid-base catalysts to um, produce platform chemicals. Um, if you're tuning um, metal doped bifunctional catalysts, we're able to um, achieve both precious metal thrifting and acid synergy to enhance fuel production. Uh, and finally, what I've shown you in the last part is we can tune mass transport by tailoring poor networks. Um, and most interestingly, if we, we can use the hierarchical networks to control the, um, the sequence with which reactants enter different zones of me macropore than mesopore, uh, within the catalyst, and that gives us the concept of spatially orthogonal catalysts. So all that really remains is to thank you um, and all the main people who've worked um, on these projects, uh, particularly uh, Professor Adam Lee, who's my colleague, who's, who's worked on all of the, uh, the projects we've discussed, and uh, all of our, our collaborators. So hopefully I uh, look forward to answering questions and in the discussion session. Thank you. Thank you to Professor Dr. Karen Wilson for her great insight and sharing. Ladies and gentlemen, now moving on to our next keynote speaker, I'm honored to give a brief introduction of Professor Dr. Abdul Rahman from Universitas Gajah Mada, Jogja, Indonesia. Professor Dr. Abdul Rahman has completed his Doctorate from the Halal Product Research Institute, University Putra Malaysia in Halal Food Analysis in 2011. Her research focuses on the analysis of product halalness and authentications of food product and pharmaceutical product. Without further delay, I'm honored to invite Professor Dr. Abdurrahman to share his presentation on, at, on the analysis of porcine gelatin in food and pharmaceutical products for halal authentication. The stage is yours, Professor. Please okay, welcome. Thank. thank Dr. Marlinda. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. First of all, I'd like to thank to this uh, organizing com committee for inviting me to uh share our knowledge and our experience on on halal authentication analysis and in this moment i'd like to uh share the analysis of percent latin in food and pharmaceutical product for halal authentication uh, i am from the center of excellent institute of halal industry and systems Untas Gejah Mada, yogyakarta and also I am former the visiting researcher in University of Malaya, Halal Research Center, University of Malaya in 2019 uh, with uh, Professor uh, Aini and also Dr. Zalina. So basically I'd like to share uh, my 
uh, my paper on a review on analytical method for analysis of porcine gelatin in food and pharmaceutical food product for halal authentication the chain publication between uh, Unitis of Gajah Mada and uh, uh, University of Malaya uh, Halal Research Center and also I also discuss a paper from uh, Nanocat by our colleague uh, Dr. Motolib and also uh, Professor uh, Rafi Johan as we know that uh, gelatin is highly purified protein obtained from hydrolysis of collagen with high molecular weight and also gelatin is one of the component commonly used in food, cosmetic and also pharmaceutical product due to its chilling properties. And as we know that 90% of gelatin is coming from a porcine or, or a bovine gelatin. Uh, therefore, it is very uh, important to to identify the gelatin sources either from porcine or from a bovine for halal authentication analysis because as we know that uh, porcine gelatin is prohibited to be consumed by muslim and jewish and considered as non-halal uh, uh, from the yeah can you share your full uh, presentation mode because now you are at the ready mode okay okay, so. okay thank you yeah, it's okay now. Is, is, is it okay? Do, do you see my slide presentation? Uh, please, uh, yeah. It's okay. Okay. Okay, as we know that uh, gelatin is uh, the mass component used in, uh, for example, in capsule and also in soft candy. And halal authentication analysis is intended to confirm that the product, food, cosmetic, pharmaceutical are free from non-halal component. Professor, huh? sorry, excuse me. Sorry, uh, we cannot see your entire screen. Can you share again the uh, entire screen? Just now we okay. can see, but uh, currently it's already lost. Maybe you can share entire screen. Okay. Uh, doctor, can you uh, yes. see my? Okay. Uh, hold on, it's coming. Yes. Okay. Okay. So, uh, halal authentication analysis is intent to confirm that the product, food, cosmetic, pharmaceutical, are free from non-halal component, and and the advanced technology in the food industry has led to the use of non-halal component. For example, is a porcine gelatin. Doctor, uh, Professor, mm -hmm. you already play the full entire screen because now we at the first slide. So not 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 uh, not in the full screen. Yes, correct. Not in the full screen. Okay. Maybe can so play I must... the presentation. Huh? Uh, just click the pre uh the uh, the full mode presentation below. I I yes I I have just the already... full screen. Okay. Uh, Seems like your slide is not moving. I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. Oh, not moving. So? Yes, is it not moving? moving? Not moving. Okay. So, is it moving? Not moving. Not moving. Yes, correct. How to make moving? 
Maybe you can change uh, to the window mode. When you share it, you change to the window mode instead of a uh, full screen. Okay. Okay. Is it okay? We, we are waiting for the screen. Okay, doctor. Hold on. Yes. Okay. Try to move your slide. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. Okay. Uh, in yes. Indonesia, we have a Indonesian law on uh, number 33, uh, year 2014, uh, concerning the halal product assurance. And in the in the fourth article. In the fourth article, product that enter, circulate, and traded in the territory of Indonesia must be certified halal. And the certification will be performed by the agency called as a Halal Examination Agency or LPH. And one of the tasks of LPH is to examine or to perform the testing, the halalness of the product halal examin examination. So we need a reliable technique or reliable method to detect non-halal component uh, percent gelatin in this case. So to comply with halal requirement, more stringent auditing or monitoring system is needed when the halal authorities or certification bodies. And analytical techniques become the major challenge for the authentication of halal product. Uh, for analysis, analysis so, uh, should be able to reliably identify the source of gelatin. And for force gelatin, we can use the uh, biomarker of DNA base as determined using uh, real time PCR or also a peptide uh, marker, biomarker as uh, determined to using LCMS MS. So, uh, for detection of porcelain gelatin, we can uh, group method into two categories. The first one is screening or exploratory method. For example, we can use the FTR spectroscopy or HPLC uh, based on amino acid composition. And also we can use the confirmatory method. For example, we can use a real-time PCR. DNA base or LC MSMS for peptide uh, profile. So this is uh, some instrument uh, can be used for uh, porcine uh, gelatin detection. We can use FTR spectrophotometer, HPLC, and real time PCR, and also uh, LC MSMS. FTR spectrometer can be used the, to identify the functional groups, and SPLC can be used for uh, analyze amino acid. In the porcine gelatin, PCR can uh, be used to identify the uh, DNA and LCMSMS can identify the peptide marker for porcine and porcine gelatin. The in in our university, uh, in our laboratory, we have two method on halal authentication, which is accredited by ISO seventeen zero two five two thousand and seventeen. Uh, the method is on uh, identification of POC and also identification of a porcelain gelatin uh, using real-time PCR. The first method is uh, analyze uh, FTR spectrophotometer. IR spectroscopy, uh, as we know, is used to the, identify the functional group present in the uh, porcelain gelatin. This is based on the interaction between electromagnetic radiation and uh, samples in IR regions. And FTR spectroscopy is rapid and sensitive, non-destructive, meaning that the analyzed samples can be further analyzed using the different instrument. Easy in sample presentation can be used in qualitative and also can be used for quantitative analysis. And the one property uh, for IR spectroscopy is the fingerprint technique, meaning that there is no 
uh, FTR Spectra. Th there is uh, no, no, no same FTR Spectra for the different samples. For example, this is a paper by our colleague in uh, Halal Product Research Institute, University of Malaysia. Uh, our colleague uh, tried to uh, differentiate between a porcelain and bovine gelatin based on FTR spectra, scope FTR spectra. So if we investigated the difference between uh, porcelain, number one is porcelain and the number second is uh, Sorry, number one is bovine and that number two is porcelain. So it looks uh, very similar. Therefore, the uh, statistical uh, program called as chemometric must be used to differentiate or to classify between a uh, porcelain and bovine gelatin. And as we know, using the discriminant analysis, we can discriminate between a uh, porcelain and also a uh, bovine. This is the porcelain and this is the Bovine. So the AR spectra is converted to, to a common plot, and then we can see the clear separation between porcelain and a bovine. And also, FTR spectroscopy is also a successful for analysis the porcelain gelatin in the food product. In this case, is candies and also capsule cells. Yeah. And again, uh, the authors use uh, some chemometric. Yeah. In this case, uh, the author use principal component analysis and also cluster analysis. And then and the porcine gelatin, fish gelatin, and bovine gelatin can be differentiated and also can be classified, classified according to its source. Uh, this is, uh, and also from the other researchers, uh, he tried to use uh, ITR, ITR, ITR spectros method for classification of gelatin in uh, gelatin source. And the second method is... Uh, SPLC and using SPLC we can differentiate a uh, porcelain and bovine uh, gelatin. Uh, and as we know that uh, gelatin is a uh, composed from amino acid, so uh, amino acid composition can be used for for differentiate between porcelain and bovine gelatin. Uh, for example, this is the SPLC chromatogram for uh, uh, for differentiate between this is the A is a porcelain and B is a bovine. And again, and the, we can use the principal component analysis to separate between uh, porcelain, bovine, and also the capsule cell uh, made from the porcelain and bovine gelatin. And the second method is uh, we can use uh, LCMSMS or liquid chromatography using a uh, mass spectrometer as a detector. As uh, in the principle, uh, in the principle, as as we know that uh, gelatin is uh, protein, and then when the protein is hydrolyzed by specific uh, enzyme, for example, is trip trypsin, yeah, trypsin enzyme, and then the enzyme will digest gelatin into a peptide with the residue of amino acid is lysine and arginine. So we can, uh, this is the, the uh, schematic uh, procedure for analysis uh, for protocol for gelatin extraction, digestion, and also LCMSMS analysis. Then the food sample uh, is uh, added with, with enzyme, and then 
um, this and then and then the uh, teacher's peptide uh, subject to LC measurement. And for for example, this is the uh, peak or uh, mass uh, obtained during LC MS MS, and from here we can uh, find the peptide marker. For example, this is the bovine marker and this is is uh, a porcine porcine uh, marker porcine gelatin marker the and the and the i think and the standard method for analysis of uh, porcine gelatin is a uh, uh, real time pcr yeah and in in this technique and the uh, porcine gelatin was extracted for a DNA composition or for DNA extraction and then the DNA extraction was used and the DNA then is was used as DNA template DNA template for further analysis and then uh, this is our 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 work on identification of porcine gelatin DNA in, in a commercial capsule cell uh, using real time uh, PCR for halal authentication. Uh, the first one is we optimize the underlying uh, temperature and then uh, we test the specific test from the specificity of a uh, primer. And from here we can see that the primer in is specific. Of uh, after that the the design primer is uh, used to analyze the commercial. Uh, candy uh, for, uh, and from the soft candy available in in Yogyakarta we try to test a uh, three soft candy and we can find that uh, the sample one is uh, and sample two soft candy one and soft uh, candy two is are, are positive to contain uh, Porcine gelatin, and also and then the then the uh, design primer is also used to test the uh, porcine gelatin in a commercial capsule cell, and the result among the tested sample the result are negative. But if the result negative, uh, the um, the negative result indicate that there is no porcine DNA in the evaluated sample. But the question is, does the DNA extraction fail or is the porcine DNA absent? Finally, uh, we must confirm what type of DNA present in sample. So the DNA, which is uh, negative for of porcine, we test using the primer, which is specific for bovine. And finally, using uh, a, a primer, which is specific to bovine, we, we, we found that the a commercial capsule cell is content to bovine gelatin. I think this is uh, my presentation, Dr. Marlinda. Uh, thank you. And I am so sorry for the inconvenience because some technical problem here. Thank you very much, Professor Dr. Abdurrahman, for addressing a very interesting topic. Um, ladies and gentlemen, now we come to the Q&A session. I will read the questions from the banner. Okay, the first questions come from Dr. Lina. The question is, thank you, Professor Abdurrahman, for the interesting topic. Regarding the methods of detection for sign gelatin, what is the most sensitive tools that can be used to, uh, with, can be used with the highest confidence? Yeah. Okay, thank uh, Dr. Marlinda and also Dr. Lina. Uh, based on our, our experience, the, the most sensitive method for detection of porcine gelatin is a real-time PCR. Because in real-time PCR, we can uh, amplify DNA into uh, the more more level. So uh, even in the very low concentration of uh, DNA in porcine gelatin, it can be detected using uh, real-time PCR. So typically, the detection limit for real-time PCR is one nano nanogram of a DNA. So this is very sensitive. Okay. 
Okay. Thank you, Professor, for your answer. Is there any question from the floor? So, a uh, question from me, uh, Prof. Uh, have you said just now that H HPLC and HCLM yeah. is the method to differentiate? Yes, uh, to differentiate. So, which one is the best between these two uh, methods? I, uh, uh, SPLC uh, mm -hmm. cannot uh, SPLC uh, cannot find the marker for uh, for gelatin, but mm -hmm. using LCM SMS we can the specific marker specific peptide uh, peptide marker in for gelatin. So LCM SMS is the uh, the choose one for detection of uh, for gelatin. So based on my uh, uh my opinion there are two methods which is can be used as the standard method because uh, till now we have no standard method for gelatin uh percent gelatin analysis even in the in the world so real-time pcr and lcm sms can be used uh or can be pro proposed as the standard method for percent gelatin uh, detection doctor okay thank you cool so uh so you think uh, when it will become like commercialized for this method for detection? Yeah, uh, the commercialized method is uh, basically uh, based on the primer design as in UPM, University of Putra Malaysia. He has designed uh, uh, um, a design what we call as Hafiz, Hafiz by Allah Yarham, Prof. Yaakob, uh, and Prof. Uh, Dr. Swemi, and so on. So, Hafiz can be a uh, pen stop instrument, which can be used for uh, onset uh, determination of uh, for gelatin. Okay, I think when again, uh, can you uh, explain again the main of using FTRs regarding your work? Okay, IR spectroscopy is uh, basically just screening method, uh, Dr. Tan. Because this is just uh, identifying the uh, uh, functional group, and as we know that the functional group composed of porcelain and bovine gelatin is basically the same. So uh, this technique is uh, uh, try to differentiate the level or the uh, different intensities of a certain peak in porcelain and bovine. So this is just screening method, uh, not a standard method yeah so the standard method is still a uh, real-time pcr and uh, lcm sms because it is very specific ir is not specific because once the component is added into the sample so the spectra will will be changed so it is very difficult to confirm uh, whether a percent or bovine gelatin Thank you, Professor, for your answer. Is there any questions? Okay, we have one more from Miss. Uh, from Miss Nina. Me, I think we have just now uh, another questions. I guess. Nina, I see the Nina, my colleague from Nanoket. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. It's just uh, thank you. Oh for your no, no, just all right. Yes. Okay, just, uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Nina is my, my colleague in UPM and also in uh, uh, Malaya University. Okay, all right. So, uh, if there is no more questions, we will thank uh, Professor Dr. Abdurrahman for your fruitful uh, sharing. Thank you once again, Professor, for joining us today in this yeah, session. I'm so sorry. All right. Okay, so now uh, we will we'll, we will move to the last presenter for today. Before we start, I would like to please to give a brief introduction of Professor I.R. Dr. Nurhayati Soen from University of Malaya. Professor I.R. Dr. Nurhayati 
has received her PhD in degree degree in electric, electrical and electronic system (MEM) system from the National University of Malaysia in 2006. She is currently a professor at University of Malaya. Her current research focuses on the re reliability of semiconductor device and integrated circuit and the MEMS sensor. Professor Ir Dr Nohayati has led the VLSI Reliability Research Group and Center of Printable Electronic at University of Malaya. So now let's listen to her presentations with the title of Printable, Flexible and Stretchable Electronic for Wearable Healthcare. I'll pass the stage over to you, Professor. You may begin. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Chairperson. Okay, uh, can you hear me? Yes, very clear. Yeah, okay, thank you. Just to test. <laughs> okay, okay. Salam, uh, okay, thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wabarakatuh and very good morning. Okay, thank you for the uh, introduction uh, of my background, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Chairperson. Okay, I'm uh, actually, I'm also uh, representing the Center of Printable Electronics, University of Malaya. So, uh, the topic that I would like to share here is on printed flexible and stretchable electronics toward wearable healthcare. Uh, just... Okay, uh, so uh, as uh, you know that uh, nowadays I believe uh, that uh, everybody uh, already use or yeah uh, maybe uh, you are using uh, these uh, wearable uh, devices uh, uh, since maybe five years ago or maybe within uh, ten year, uh, ten years back. Uh, it's just that uh, this is the uh, widely used uh, technology, and uh, what uh, I mean uh, what's in uh, our uh, focus here is. Uh, what's inside uh, this uh, technology and uh, what are the uh, uh, what are the important uh, thing that uh, we should uh, think about in order to design the wearable uh, wearable healthcare okay for the uh, use of uh, i mean uh, the most uh, widely uh, used is the on the biomedical uh, applications okay so a wearable device is a piece uh, of I mean, uh, a piece of device, or uh, we can uh, we can uh, say it is a uh, isolated device to make a system. So over here, as we uh, we can see, uh, since uh, everybody now is a very you know uh, you are very concerned about uh, the health, right? So everything uh, must be uh, everything must be monitored. Every uh, all the parameters of the you know uh, the uh, body parameters in terms of the um, in terms of the temperature humidity and then uh, maybe the uh, heart okay uh, depends on the uh, background of the uh, health and uh, even for the fitness also we are uh, I mean busy uh, you know uh, busy uh, looking at uh, how to analyze our uh, fitness right uh, how we want to uh, monitor and then uh, it seems that every day, every everything uh, is uh, uh, getting uh, con uh, conscious about the um, health so uh, that's why uh, nowadays you can see even for industry ir 4.0 you can see everything's are uh, connected so uh, the applications of uh, this actually uh, link to the uh, wearable device in the medical uh, applications Okay, so uh, we can see the uh, trends, okay, uh, of the wearable technology. And here uh, for the US wearable technology market size by, by product from 2016 to 2027, you can have the USD in billion. And the worldwide market sale of wearable te technology, you can see uh, it is expected to rise up to USD 104.39 billion by 2027 for the ease of use. Okay, the well-developed wearable electronics uh, or sensing devices should feature with, uh, as you can see, uh, okay, everybody want to uh, put on the uh, devices, okay, on the wrist. And then uh, maybe uh, you have uh, uh, so many, I mean, uh, so many parts that uh, you want to monitor the parameters. So, of course, you need the good 
uh, and flexible, stretchable, and you can have the ability of continuously real-time monitoring, okay, where uh, you can have the special chips, okay, on the wearable device, and it is connected to the uh, system of uh, internet. So for the monitoring, and then comfortable yet conformal and biocompatible to the measured surface, non-invasive, lightweight, and compact, especially for, you know, uh, for aging, for elderly, and uh, also for the fitness, right? Uh, and I believe that the Olympic Games for the Olympic or the Paralympic, uh, uh, you can see that uh, all the sportsmen, right? Uh, if you observe, they, they are uh, wearing the wearable devices in order for the monitoring uh, on the training and also uh, during the uh, games itself. And uh, the specification, uh, specific, the specification also must be long reliability, low cost, high sensing uh, performance. So uh, since uh, this is like the uh, in the good trend of market, so in research, of course, we are looking for the, uh, I mean, uh, yeah, good performance, but we have to think about the low cost, but long reliability. Okay, so we can have like wearable in terms of uh, wristwear. Okay, you have the smartwatch, right? The smartwatch can uh, detect, uh, I mean, uh, all the important parameters, right? Heartbeat, okay, uh, and you can have the temperature. Now, the, uh, nowadays, you can have like, uh, yeah, uh, we need like uh, since uh, during the era of COVID-19 pandemic, right? So there are so many parameters that you want to uh, monitor, so for research, yeah, of course, uh, the, the researchers uh, can think about how to improve the existing uh, smartwatch or uh, other wearable devices in order to uh, support uh, the monitoring of the uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Okay, for the eyewear, headwear, bodywear, okay, you can have, uh, nowadays you can have the, uh, we call it a smart stack style. Okay, we are, we are, uh, they are using the uh, flexible and stretchable uh, material uh, for the uh, electronics and uh, neckwear as well. Okay, so uh, for, uh, of course, uh, those days uh, you have uh, everything, yeah, everything is uh, electronics for the monitoring, but uh, they rely on the rigid electronics. Okay, hard electronics, rigid electronics components, okay, making it difficult for them to be integrated into fabrics and small devices. But uh, now I believe that maybe uh, most, of, uh, most of you already, uh, I mean, uh, already uh, own uh, the uh, wearable uh, devices uh, such as a wristwatch, okay, to monitor your fitness and uh, other, uh, other monitoring uh, devices. But uh, here, as you can see that uh, how uh, the, I mean, the flexible and the stretchable um, characteristic are needed in order to design uh, the uh, chips that uh, uh, which are uh, appropriate or suitable in order to put on surface skin surface and uh, other part uh, which are um, which are yeah maybe we can see uh, which are uh, also uh, very soft right okay so um, these flexible components are made to stay operative even when their shape is manipulated to fit with fabrics or other wearables. So whatever, uh, uh, I mean, whatever stretching, okay, or, uh, whatever, uh, whatever uh, this uh, displacement done, that means uh, that would uh, that that won't um, uh, that won't uh, affect uh, the parameters that are being monitored. Okay, so developing flexible and related properties such as stretchability into these systems enables electronics to be added in wider range of applications and products where flexibility is essential. Yeah, of course, when we are talking nowadays, uh, everybody using all the electronics gadgets such as laptop, PC, handphone, and then you have the tablets, right? But insights are uh, the, uh, we call it as a rigid uh, electronics. But when when uh, when we comes to the uh, applications that uh, you need the uh, you know you need to put uh, on the uh, I mean in the dynamic uh, dynamic position, so we need uh, something or you need chips and the electronics to be fabricated on the uh, flexible substrate. Okay, so that's why you can have a very small very small device, but yet the electronics is actually in terms of they can do the printing instead of using the uh, fabrication that being uh, adapted by the uh, microchip uh, fabrication or semiconductor 
fabrication. So that's why uh, you need the uh, flexible and stretchable device, but also we need the low cost in which we have the special technique in order to do the, uh, uh, to realize uh, this device. Okay, so this uh, this is a 10-year market uh, projection split by materials or components. So you can have nowadays even uh, maybe you uh, observe that there's already stretchable displays, okay? And then stretchable logic, stretchable energy storage, harvesting, right? Then you can you you can uh, you you can see that how the uh, temperature body temperature can harvest in order to uh, create the uh, energy resources, stretchable actuators, sensors, okay? And then uh, you have stretchable PCB, so you you are no longer looking at a very hard uh, PCB in physical. You have stretchable uh, e textile for the smart um, uh, smart. Like, uh, yeah, you can have, uh, there are so many um, uh, smart uh, textile, stretchable encapsulant, and then stretchable cabling and yarns, stretchable conduct, conductive polymer. Okay, so there are uh, many uh, in more electronics, right? So uh, nowadays, when we are talking about electronics, so now we want to have the soft electronics. Okay, so printed electronics. Okay, it's a set of printing methods used to create electrical devices on various substrates. Okay, the conventional uh, techniques uh, is actually uh, currently, okay, ongoing, uh, which are, uh, I mean, uh, the uh, manufacturing still uh, using the conventional in terms of the fabrication of integrated circuits, microchips, yeah. So they are using, still using uh, the uh, fabrication, that type of fabrication method. It's just that actually we can uh, use that particular uh, process in order to create this uh, flexible or stretchable uh, electronics. But uh, now our focus is we want to have a very, uh, I mean, a short time and low cost uh, techniques in order to do the um, electronic uh, devices because uh, these devices actually is not, uh, I mean, uh, it's not consisting of uh, billions or millions of transistors and we can use this uh, printable uh, technology in order to uh, fabricate. We don't have to use uh, the technique of uh, fab fabrication for the like uh, IC or uh, CMOS uh, technology. Okay, so uh, uh, printing typical, uh, Printing typically uses common printing equipment suitable for defining patterns on material such as screen printing, flexography, gra graver, offset lithography, and inject. So nonetheless, flexible electronics are not as efficient as silicon ICs for computation and signal communication. So that's why, of course, you cannot have 100%. Uh, you cannot win everything, but uh, you, you can win uh, about the uh, costing. Right, but not the you know when you do the printing when you want to realize your transistors actually they want to replace okay the rigid components, but we still use the transistors and other electronic components. But now we want to uh, use different technology in order to fabricate the electronics, and of course the performance cannot be uh, uh, same as the one that they uh, fabricated using the IC fabrication techniques. Okay, flexi uh, for the flexible hybrid electronics, okay, this leverages the strengths of these two dissimilar technologies. Okay, you can uh, merge, okay, you can combine uh, both uh, type of uh, uh, electronics and it uses flexible and printed electronics where flexibility and scalability are required. So you can see that uh, you can have flexible substrate and then you can have flexible devices to be printed on top of the flexible uh, flexible substrate. So you can have uh, the uh, normal ICs also can be uh, printed, okay, can be uh, on the top of the flexible uh, hybrid electronics. So we are no longer using the uh, PCB, the normal PCB, and we use uh, the uh, component on the PCB, uh, which is the PCB is very hard, okay, for the... Um, medical or for the wearable uh, usage. Okay, combining flexible electronics and silicon IC yields a very powerful and versatile technology with a vast range of applications. So uh, at this moment, we uh, still uh, have to uh, make the hybridization between uh, the conventional, we call it as a IC technology, 
then we combine with the flexible uh, electronics technology in order to um, give the good performance of the system. Okay, so as uh, I just uh, give the brief uh, different to conventional, uh, the different uh, between uh, the conventional or tra traditional electronics and primitive electronics. Okay, uh, you can have uh, for those who are uh, working on the semiconductor devices or optoelectronic devices, right? So you can have, uh, yeah, made in batches on wafers in the clean room. But if you are using the technology of printed electronics, it can be printed on a roll, right? But not in the uh, non, uh, uh, in a cleaning uh, room. So uh, that means, uh, of course, when we use the clean room, the cost is uh, very high. And uh, yeah, we, we must have like uh, the uh, target. We need the wearable device with the printed technology of the uh, components. Uh, we want to target on the wearable, but it is uh, very uh, cost effective, and uh, we can uh, we can have uh, again the uh, good uh, reliability, but uh, we we can still uh, uh, we can still facing like the uh, problem on the performance. Of course, when we do print electronic, you can have the uh, I mean uh, the uh, the disadvantages. You might have devices run slowly. Okay, so you have layers added by printing and then you have lower resolution, but you have cheap processing. So, of course, uh, it depends on what uh, what is your uh, focus when you want to do uh, the design of your sensors, especially sensors, right? So, uh, whether you can have like, uh, uh, yeah, uh, it depends on the uh, applications, what you're going to design and realize. But of course, if you are talking about the um, wearable device for biomedical applications, right? Maybe it can be, uh, it can be. Uh, I mean, uh, it is non-invasive or invasive. So you have to, to think about the printed electronics uh, to be uh, to realize uh, your uh, design. Okay, so this is the printing technologies. Okay, so uh, this uh, actually controlled uh, material deposition for customized pattern with ink formulation. So uh, this is on there are so there, there, there are so many uh, uh, there are so many methods in which uh, for my uh, center of print, printable electronics we have um, 3D printing okay and then uh, we have the inkjet printing so here uh, in order to realize uh, the uh, printing uh, printed uh, electronics of like uh, and flexible uh, electronics parts you can uh, use uh, inkjet printing Okay, screen printing, gravier printing, and then you have uh, other uh, type of printing uh, such as aerosol jet printing, flexophic printing, and offset printing. And you can also have transfer printing or nano imprinting. Okay, so uh, for this uh, type, you can say uh, you can see that it involves stamping process of a pattern on mold into resist material of receiver substrate. And 3D printing nowadays are very famous. It's just that, yeah, of course, 3D printing, there are so many types of 3D printing, and it depends on the availability of your funding. Okay, what type of 3D printing or what type of 3D printer that you are, uh, you know, uh, is available. Uh, then uh, this one, uh, of course, uh, specialized for hybridizing, hybridizing fabrication for electrodes and interconnects. Okay, so uh, in our, I mean, uh, for research purposes, actually, uh, yeah, we can start uh, doing the uh, printing technologies based on the availability of uh, the uh, facilities. But we have to go by, uh, you know, based on uh, the um, the uh, availability of the uh, research grant. Okay, so uh, if you can see the uh, the, I mean, uh, the the uh, the simple one, okay, uh, and. Uh, I would call is uh, economical is the screen printing okay where this is like the uh, yeah this is just like the uh, we call it as a stencil uh, uh, sheet on top of the sheet and requires a CPU squeeze inks through the mask but uh, whatsoever method that uh, we want to uh, choose uh, again it depends on uh, the design and the application of uh, our uh, devices. Okay, so these are the uh, characteristics of the application. If uh, you are using inkjet, yeah, the, the, the advantage, uh, easy patterning compatible with various solvent for ink formulation, minimal contamination and waste. So uh, for this inkjet, yeah, uh, when you do uh, the design, of course, whether you want to uh, print the electrodes 
and then you have to uh, to make sure that what what would be the ink okay and then uh, solvent for the ink right? so uh, everything have to be uh, selected uh, i mean uh, accordingly but disadvantage prone to clogging and nozzle damage so here for the inkjet uh, during uh, okay this uh, would be a problem if you i mean uh, once you have started with this uh, experiment so you have to make sure you uh, continue your experiment uh, you know uh, till uh, everything uh, completed otherwise uh, you have your uh, printer cartridge will be clogged okay especially during this uh, pandemic era right uh, where our uh, i mean our lab okay has been affected on the you know uh, the MCO, so we also have this problem. But now, uh, one uh, I think one, more than one month we already started with this uh, experiment. Then uh, we have to uh, maintain uh, the uh, running of this experiment in order to uh, avoid this problem. Okay, for the screen printing, uh, it is a low fabrication cost uh, for mass production, but limited by accuracy, control on thickness and waste heavy process. Okay, for the gravier, high speed and suitable for high volume printing requires different costly engraved cylinders for every pattern. And for the transfer or nano print, nano structure patterning with less than one micrometer uh, mismatch. Okay, disadvantage pattern layer easily damaged due to air and uh, bubbles and ink sticking. Okay, for the 3D printing, of course, this is a high precision paste deposition and support comfortably designed files. Only use dedicated ink cartridge filament. So these are the disadvantage. So of course, if you want to reduce the cost of the experiment, uh, we can, uh, I mean, uh, we can try to, uh, yeah, formulate or we can try to design the uh, filament in order for run uh, for running the 3D printing. Okay, so applications uh, displays sensors, energy, and electronic devices. So from inkjet, uh, you have the thin film uh, transistors, 3D printing, screen print, uh, printed electrochemical sensor, gravier printed uh, solar cells, and transfer printed LED. So these are the uh, technology and uh, that we have to identify which are uh, which uh, technology is suitable for our design and for our uh, budget okay so uh, uh, towards autonomous epidemic system so this is the example where they are using the uh, printed uh, flexible uh, transistors for these systems okay you have the autonomous lab on skin system where they have the sensor electronics okay so you can imagine uh, on the uh, uh, on the patch Right, you have energy source, transducer, converter, storage, and sensor actuator. So everything are electronics. Okay, sensor and actuators, of course, it is a mechanical, but again, it has to be uh, uh, fabricated and connected to the uh, electronics. Okay, so that's electronics also fabricated. Okay, using the uh, printed. Uh, uh, electronic so you can uh, imagine for the storage okay what would be the uh, con uh, i mean uh, what would be the structure of the storage okay is it the uh, uh, nowadays you can have uh, there are so many uh, flexible storage systems okay you have the flexible substrate okay fet and then uh, laser scribe graphene polymer electrolyte so you can have uh, the uh, special storage system Okay, that one also is uh, the, uh, instead of having a normal silicon storage, you already got the flexible storage systems. So you can see uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the epidemic full cells harvest energy from human perspiration. So uh, when you do your exercise, at the same time, okay, all the movement, all the thermal will be converted into energy and again will be uh, supporting as a uh, energy resources to the system. Okay, so these are the challenges and strategies for flexible, stretchable devices to work on human body. Okay, so uh, mechanically aspect, you have a mecha uh, mechanical aspect, bi biological aspect, and you have the uh, thermal effect. So for the mechanical, uh, you have the uh, aspect of stretchability, 
conformal contact, skin-like uh, stress, strain behavior. And then for the bio biological, so being pressable, yeah, of course, when you have a special textile, okay, it must be, uh, you know, uh, uh, you when you uh, put on uh, put on uh, the textile, it must be uh, comfort, right? Uh, very easy for you to press. And then uh, biodegradability, yeah, uh, this is uh, again, uh, which is you have to make sure it is uh, biocompatible, no rejection, okay, encapsulation with biocompatible materials like PDMS, silicon, hydrogel, and protein, and etc. Inhibition of bacteria, yeah, of course, when you design, right, so what type of uh, material, right, so that you cannot have this uh, type of uh, problem. Okay, for the thermal, uh, thermal, aspect of thermal, thermal management. So when you do the uh, strategy of the flexible, stretchable devices, okay, you have to make sure the thermal conductivity, okay, uh, uh, what is the management of the thermal conducti conductivity on the system. Okay, so this is another uh, example of flexible electrochemical sensor for non-invasive sweat analysis. Okay, nowadays, uh, as you can see, there are so many, you know, uh, applications, right? Uh, one of uh, the example, they want to analyze, uh, I mean, uh, analyze uh, the uh, when you are uh, sweating and there must be a special sensor and systems. So, uh, for the part A, you can have a common structure of flexible electrochemical sensor because this one, you have to put uh, on the, uh, uh, on the uh, wrist. Okay, so uh, you have the uh, like the tattoo biosensor, right? So where you have something like uh, yeah, uh, on top of the skin, right? Where uh, you have the uh, I mean you can uh, do the uh, anal uh, analysis where you have your um, we call it as a uh, wireless. It, it can be uh, read uh, using the uh, handphone uh, platform or apps. Okay, so you have the schematic of the wearable sweat monitoring patch and the structure of the glucose sensor. So with these uh, parameters, right, so uh, all the uh, important parameters can be analyzed and they can uh, have the uh, conclusion of, uh, using this uh, sensing uh, platform. So this sensing platform needs the electrodes. So how do you want to fabricate the electrodes? Together with the electronics must be all flexible and all uh, must, uh, must use the flexible substrates. Okay, so uh, uh, with that, uh, I've uh, I've given the uh, applications of the wearable, uh, print, uh, printable, and flexible electronics. Where my uh, at my uh, lab or at my center of printable electronics, we already started uh, the uh, experiment or research on the uh, flexible uh, electronics uh, on the wearable device. Uh, focus uh, mainly focus on the glucose uh, sensor. Okay, the uh, grant also uh, supporting, uh, I mean, we have the industrial grant, which is CRES grant, okay, supporting us uh, in doing the designing and uh, later we are will be having the prototype of the uh, uh, glu glu wearable glucose uh, sensors. Okay, so uh, I would like to conclude, okay, printable electronics have shown significant effects in many cutting edge applications for wearable techno technology, especially in the fields of uh, personalized healthcare or biomedical, environmental and process control monitoring, human machine interface and flexible electronic devices. So uh, this is uh, supporting the uh, IR 4.0 where you can have, uh, you know, uh, all the uh, even processes for the additive manufacturing also would support uh, this uh, scope of uh, research. And printed electronics have many advantages over conventional components. The main advantages are flexibility of the component, and lower set up cost of manufacturing. So that would be the target of uh, my center of printable electronics where uh, we can produce uh, the sensors system, okay, wearable, but with the low cost, okay. So there is no one correct printing techniques for all applications. So we have to uh, find out which is suitable to our applications and our budget. And the limitations of each method must be considered and the best option chosen for the situation. So the reliability concerns also must be considered when choosing a printing techniques and materials. 
So uh, with that, uh, I end up my presentation and op I open for uh, question and answers. Okay, thank you very much, Professor I.R. Dr. Nuhayati for addressing a very interesting topic. So ladies and gentlemen, we come to the Q&A sessions. All right, okay, we have a questions from Dr. Tan. In your opinion, what is the greatest achievement for the flexible hybrid electronic application so far? I mean the FHE applications in consumer product in the market. Please, do, please, bro. Okay, uh, thank you for the uh, question, Dr. Tan. Yeah, uh, uh, to me, uh, we have a very tremendous, uh, you know, a tremendous ach uh, achievement uh, up there, right? Uh, especially in terms of... Uh, the application of the uh, biomedical and the uh, sports uh, sports applications okay you have uh, many industries right industries uh, such as uh, even uh, when we are talking about industries uh, you can uh, you can see the uh, special brand right if if you have the like the uh, maybe uh, you have the uh, yeah omron and then you have like the sport right sport brand there are so many uh, uh, sport uh, smart watch right uh, so they are you know they are really like uh, uh, really competing right uh, 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 producing uh, the very uh, very uh, good specifications uh, of a smart watch and uh, other for the biomedical measurement right for the monitoring and uh, as, as 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 you know uh, nowadays even uh, the researchers uh, really focusing on upgrading uh, the uh, devices because now we are in the pandemic COVID-19 and uh, the demand is really high. Okay, is that uh, 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 answering your uh, question, Dr. Tan? The okay, grant, uh, I, I just uh, add a little bit, the grant also, if you can see uh, nowadays, the grant is uh, really, you know, uh, uh, there, are, there are a lot of uh, grant that uh, can, uh, I mean, uh, they, are, they are offering the grant related to uh, this type of like monitoring uh, by using the wearable devices. Okay, am I uh, answering your uh, question, Dr. Tan? Okay, uh, Prof, we have one more question from yeah. uh, Dr. Ong. Uh, in your opinion, what is the best power source for these wearable devices? Okay, so as I'm concerned, uh, even uh, when we're talking about, uh, you know, uh, wearable that uh, now we have the energy harvesting, right? So, uh, yeah, yeah, we right. have... Uh, yeah, uh, uh, energy harvesting is uh, uh, one aspect. And if you want to have the special battery, we have the flexible battery. So uh, actually, we can have like a split or maybe uh, to me, energy harvesting now is uh, yeah uh, uh, quite uh, widely used for the energy harvesting because we do have if on our human body, right? We have, uh, uh, we have uh, like... Uh, uh, the uh, parts in order to uh, create to harvest uh, the uh, energy in order to become our uh, uh, I mean uh, source of energy because I think that is the practical of the uh, devices uh, because we harvest the uh, our own energy rather than having uh, the uh, supply battery that we want to uh, replace. Okay. Is that okay, Professor? Professor? Dr. Ong, is it answering your question? I think you uh, prof already answered the question. Okay, is there any more questions from the floor? If there is no questions, I have one question, prof. Yes. Um, uh, as we know, uh, as a young researcher in the lab, we always are uh, doing a research in the uh, lab lab based skill. So uh, maybe you can share your opinions, how and what approach that can be, uh, can we use to fabricate yeah. the device towards the, to getting the complete or uh, function device? 
Okay. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, of course. Uh, actually, center of printable electronics is very new. So I've uh, I've uh, I've gone through start from zero or start from A, right? So we we start with having uh, the lab only, right? So Alhamdulillah, now we already uh, up to the third year of uh, the establishment of this center of printable electronics. We we already got the. Uh, you know, we already got the uh, facilities. What we start, uh, we start off with the uh, training, right? We already have a new PhD students, master student. So we have the training to uh, at least um, uh, make the familiarization session for the uh, students to uh, create the simple structure first. Right, of course, in order to uh, to have the uh, printing or to create the, uh, to realize the complete device, uh, it would take like, uh, I would say that if complete, we want to do the testing and we have the clinical, right? So it would take, like the, I think, uh, complete of PhD three years. But at this moment, how to start? We, we, we have done like the uh, simulation part first, right? We have the uh, software. While waiting for the uh, facilities to be uh, arrived, because due to COVID also we have problems, right? So we have okay. to do the modeling, right? Modeling and doing the design uh, using the software. And now uh, we already started to do the, uh, uh, we train the uh, like science officers and then the students using the, uh, like the uh, screen printing, and then uh, 3D printer, we already started. So uh, whatever we have to observe, Right, we do the print. Uh, you do the printing uh, based on our design, and then we have to analyze because this is not like uh, you do, and then you can have exactly what you uh, you have designed. But uh, this is uh, uh, to me, it is first of all, it is a trial and error first. Then uh, you can uh, you can uh, com uh, com you can confirm on the parameters of the printing. Right, because uh, we have to set up the optimum temperature and then we have to make sure the recipe of the ink and the solvent uh, uh, itself, right? So once they uh, already, uh, you know, uh, confirm on the recipe, on the type of solvent, ink, right, matching to our design, then they can create the uh, complete structures. Okay, thank you so much for your advice. I'm really appreciate it. So is there any questions from the floor? Let me check. Um, okay, I think we don't have, uh, there is no more question from the floor. So I would like to uh, thanks again, Professor I.R. Dr. Hayati Soen for your very fruitful and uh, exciting uh, sharing. So. Okay, thank you, Miss Chairperson. Thank you. All right, so now we reach at the end of the sessions. So thank you your, for your participation. So on behalf of the MICNC 2021 Organizing Committee, I would like to seek your uh, cooperation to fill up the feedback, uh, feedback form that is given by the session moderator in the chat box. So before I end the, uh, the session today, I would like to invite all of you to join the upcoming event, which is the para session four that will be started, I think it's, started already is about 10 40 a.m or you may also refer to the uh, reception desk for the pro program schedule so hope to see you again thank you and assalamualaikum
Introducing the latest cold field emission technology with our new and innovative Hitachi Regulus series, providing the ultimate in resolution across all voltage ranges and imaging needs. Hitachi is proud to introduce our innovative product lineup of electron microscopes, the Regulus series, which are built upon Hitachi's award-winning, highly reliable core technology for superior ultra-high resolution imaging with the most advanced detection system available. The Regulus Series Cold Field Emission SEM provides unsurpassed image observation and microanalysis at low acceleration voltage conditions, as well as delivering unmatched beam brightness and stability. The Regulus Series novel CFE gun technology employs our patented mild flashing technology and an advanced vacuum system design, which greatly minimizes gas molecule deposition on the emitter tip. Every system is designed to always operate in a clean environment, resulting in higher signal-to-noise levels and beam current stability, delivering unparalleled imaging and robust analytical performance for extended elemental analysis routines. As with all Hitachi electron microscopes, EBSD can be added to further enhance the analytical capabilities of the instrument. The Regulus series and the introduction of these new features brings Hitachi to the next level of our award-winning and proven cold field emission technology. These enhanced performance capabilities open a new gateway for ultra-low voltage surface analysis as low as 10 volts, optimized for the observation of beam-sensitive samples such as polymers or organic materials in their natural state, without beam damage or sample deformation. The specimen chamber configuration allows for sample sizes that can vary up to 200 millimeters in diameter, while providing a fast pump down time of about one minute to observation, allowing further flexibility for sample imaging. The beam is optimized to yield a lanting voltage of 10 volts to 30,000 volts with selective energy filtering, offering fine contrast differentiation throughout the entire range. New to the Regulus series are additional detectors selectively tuned by the user amounts to imaging a wide range of backscattered electrons at the atomic level, resulting in rich contrast levels and surface details. A stem detection device is also available on the Regulus series, which provides internal specimen information that can be obtained simultaneously along with the secondary electron image. Additionally available is a bright field stem aperture that works to deliver enhanced resolution as well as contrast differentiation when imaging materials of similar densities. The Regulus series is outstanding for biomedical research applications. Optional configurations are able to accommodate a wide variety of sample sizes and imaging demands. Hitachi SEMs have contributed significantly to the advancement of material science, medical research, industrial production and manufacturing, and research in academic institutions worldwide. A multitude of supported applications such as correlative imaging for light and electron microscopy, or correlative techniques with AFM, in addition to others in the field of image processing and automation are designed out of the box with every regular series microscope. Continuing in this tradition of providing robust, reliable, and innovative instrumentation with the lowest cost of ownership, Hitachi's Regulus series delivers the ultimate FESM with unmatched brightness and beam stability, affording ultra-high resolution imaging and high-quality elemental analysis at low voltages, with a variety of configurations to meet your requirements. <laughs>